All right, welcome everyone. It's the last conversation of today. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, also, thank you to the people online for joining us. Um, I'm gonna introduce you really briefly to all of the speakers that we have for today. And we're gonna go through some slides and we're gonna have a lot of time for Q and A's towards the end. Uh, since, you know, in the previous sessions, we saw a lot of people have a lot of questions and we want to be able to address some of your questions. Also for the people online, uh, feel free to ask us as many questions as you want. We'll take a lot of time for that. Um, so we have here Paul from Super Pedestrian. Uh, we have Lee from B Cycle. We have Brian from Bird Scooters. And we have Colin from Lyft. And Colin is going to take us away right now with the first presentation. Thank you so much. Yep, got it. Said it, it took, they said it took a second to start up. Um, so hello everybody, I'm Colin Hughes uh, with Lyft. Um, I manage the policy for Lyft's transit bike and scooter business. Um, here to talk about uh, equity and mobility uh, today. Um, and I, I think, let's see, I think to start out, I wanna start out by acknowledging some challenges in mobility that probably micromobility won't be able to solve. Um, and, uh, and, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what Lyft is doing to try to improve on equity in micromobility. And I'll share some data then and show you where we're at, uh, how, how the systems have been working in terms of some data on uh, mobility. Um, and you know, first, before we get started, like, you know, I was thinking what some people say, like, is bike share? I think when I first started working in bike share, I really thought bike share can save the world. You know, it's gonna give everybody access to a bike. It's gonna give everybody um, a way to get around cities. Um, and you know, I still really believe in the power of it. But I think we also have to acknowledge there's some pretty big challenges. Um, even starting just right now, uh, you know, like I was talking with some of the panelists, um, this is not a very equitable uh, panel in terms of its representation, especially to talk about a topic like equity. I was talking with a lot of the folks here and uh, we all felt a little uncomfortable about that. Um, so I think it's just something we could start by acknowledging. Um, you know, uh, we, we unfortunately don't even have a female uh, present. Uh, Regina Kalelu was gonna join and had to back out this morning. Um, so, you know, we have to think about the perspective and the, the position that we are in as we talk about this topic. Um, so, you know, and, and I think that's something, you know, we can think about as advocates, the companies, mine included, um, you know, who they're bringing on the team. Um, we, we definitely need, more diversity of perspective to solve this problem. So um, worth acknowledging. Um, another big challenge uh, is, you know, the way is public funding and the policy behind it. Uh, California right now spends $24 billion a year on transportation and about 550 million on uh, bicycle and active transportation. So that's about 2% of the budget right now. Um, and further, um, in you know, micromobility or bike share specifically in most cities um, is unsubsidized, and so it has to compete with all these other subsidized modes of travel. Um, you know, those are pretty; those are difficult barriers to overcome. Um, and then also, bike infrastructure is a major challenge to achieving equity in our cities. And I just really quickly um, pulled a couple maps. This is a pretty simple. Uh, comparison or analysis, if you will, but this is this is the Google bike map of Oakland where we are right now. Um, we're right over here in downtown. There's a big area, you know, you can see a density of bike infrastructure in the north and western parts of the city, but you can also see a big area here uh, where there is very little bike infrastructure. Um, if we look at the same map, but we lay overlay an income map on it uh, with the red areas being the lowest income and the blue being the highest income, we can see that that same zone um, also has some of the lowest incomes in the city. Um, and then when we look at another map uh, where we have race, we can see that the same zone also has the highest concentration of non-white people in the city. Um, and so, you know, this is uh, one, this is a definition, you know, this is kind of definitional to uh, inequity in mobility. And this is the kind of thing that's really hard for micromobility to overcome because if people are gonna use scooters and bikes, they need a safe place to do it. Um, Locating scooters and bikes here would be really hard for our businesses because very few people would use them. There's very few safe places to use them. Um, so we kind of have to get the infrastructure, we have to get 
uh, first, you know, we all we we need, I think, um, a diversity of perspectives and viewpoints <laughs> to figure this, this out. We need to have the funding for the infrastructure, and then the infrastructure that we do get needs to be put and developed equitably across our cities. So, you know, um, still really believe that micromobility can do a lot to improve this situation, but there are some big structural hurdles that we should acknowledge um, along the way. Um, so, you know, what is Lyft as one of the uh, micromobility operators doing to try to improve equity in our cities? Uh, one of the first things we do is we have um, low income or equity programs. Um, and this is to offer bike share as a highly affordable option to income eligible uh, residents of our cities. So in the Bay Area, well, in all of our programs, we have a bike share for all program. Um, the way you qualify is if you qualify for any government assistance, um, assisted housing, um, if you qualify for SNAP or CalFresh or um, Muni Lifeline Transit Pass, any governmental low income program, we then consider, if you can show us proof of that, we consider you eligible for our low income membership. Um, and that is just $5 a month. It's, for your first year is $5 for the entire year to join. It's $5 a month after that. Um, and that gives you unlimited 45 minute trips on our bikes uh, here for Bay Wheels, for instance. So if you're riding um, a classic bike, a pedal bike, you get unlimited free 45 minute trips. If you wanna take out one of our e-bikes, there's no unlock fee and it's just five cents a minute. So it's a really low cost way um, to, to get around the city, that's essentially like a 90% discount um, and you know, generally gonna be cheaper than transit uh, for most of your rides. Um, and you know, the impact of that uh, in, the, in the Bay Area, um, pre-COVID, our system here was doing extremely well. For a program like this, we had 1,100, 1,100 members. Um, during COVID, that decreased by 60%, like all of our memberships did. People weren't leaving their house. They weren't paying even for their low-cost equity program. But we've been promoting this, oftentimes in concert with advocacy partners and community organizations. We've got that back up now to over 800 members, and it's increasing month over month. So that's a positive thing. Um, the other thing we realize is when we can get... so. When we can get people signed up for this program, they use it really heavily. The average uh, low income rider member of our bike share program um, takes three and a half times more trips than uh, a standard member. So when we, can, when we can reach people with this, they find it really useful. Uh, the difficult part has often been reaching these communities. And that, that is where oftentimes partnerships with advocates like many of the folks here and community organizations are super important because uh, they have the community connections, they know folks, um, they have the trust built, and they can introduce these kind of new bike share programs, get people to understand them and get them signed up. Um, and then it can be a real asset. But it's not, I think my point here is it's not as simple as just offering it, you really have to make people aware of it and reach them uh, where they are. We also do a number of community programs. Um, one of, one of my favorites was a two-year-long partnership with LeBron James, partnered with Lyft uh, to bring bike access uh, to youth in cities. Um, we did that through mostly through the YMCA. And so we would have LeBron come in, um, do an event where uh, you know, youth, oftentimes ages 16 to 20, associated with the YMCA, could come in, you know, meet LeBron. They would get a helmet. They would get a uh, free annual pass to uh, the bike share system and, um, and, and they had to be enrolled in a, a youth transition program, which is often aimed at about 18 year olds who are you know, exiting high school, going on to college or entering the workforce. And this became then a way for them uh, to get around their cities. Um, we also, during when COVID hit, uh, this was a very difficult time, I think for a lot of us operators. Um, we, uh, Lyft never stopped operating any of our programs, kept them up. Um, and we launched a critical workforce program. So we would partner with hospitals, large employers, frontline workers, give them uh, free access to the bikes. Um, and that program we just recently wind down. Um, we also work with a number of community organizations here in Oakland. We did a large lift up program. And so uh, worked with groups um, such as uh, the Oakland Collective, um, e or sorry, East Oakland Collective, um, and a number of the bike advocacy groups. Those are all ways that we use the community connections that those groups have to kind of um, reach folks and um, 
that folks who come from traditionally underserved neighborhoods and communities and help them access our program. Um, and so, so that's, those are a couple of things we've been doing. How's it now I'm talking about how it's going. Um, this is what we, Lyft does do a demographic study every year of everybody who rides the system. We ask about race, income, um, a number of other socioeconomic factors. Um, this is all available online for every market that we're in, scooter or bike. Um, and so this is what it looks like on Bay Wheels. 58% um, of our riders identify as uh, a racial or ethnic minority. Um, that is about right on the, in, in the entire Bay Area, 59% um, of the population identifies as such. This is about right equal. Within our service area, we, we are actually probably seeing over-representation of um, ethnic and racial minorities on the system. Um, so, uh, you know, we think that's a positive thing that that is helping make uh, the mobility system more equitable. Um, we, we still see a little, we still see an underrepresentation of women using the system. Um, our member base is about 38% female. Um, so that is something that we still try to work on. Um, you know, another I think key point is the median household income of our riders is 57,000. That's for the whole household per year. Um, that is, that is uh, less than half of what the Bay Area median household income is. So, you know, I think we oftentimes have a picture of bike share micro mobility users as predominantly, you know, probably folks that look like me, right? Like, you know, middle aged, uh, white, uh, you know, professional using it. Um, when we actually check the, the data, it's a little bit, it's actually a little bit more complex than that. And we, we do see that the usership is, is more equitable than I think is oftentimes um, thought. And so now talking a little bit about where, how we think we can still improve because we don't think it's perfect. We want to improve. Um, you know, one of the things right now in the, for Bay Wheels and for many of our systems is Lyft completely subsidizes the low income program. Um, but in a couple cities like New York and Portland, the city actually subsidizes that membership. And I think what that does you bring more funds in. In Portland, it allowed us to expand the system. So, uh, and Chicago as well, where we can, instead of um, just having to, instead of having to be on a public assistance program, um, the, the, there's a higher income threshold. So you can qualify even as like a lower middle-class person per se, making 300% of federal poverty limit. You know, be expanding the threshold to enter a low cost program and funding it with public funds all incentivizes more folks to join it and more folks to then use the system and ride it and enjoy those benefits of bike share um, being even more affordable. Um, so public funds is a big one. Uh, you know, operational subsidies is again, another major subsidy. Operational subsidies is what allows, if you've been to Paris, Vailib is absolutely everywhere in the city and even in uh, the lower income Banlieu uh, suburbs around the city. Um, they have the operational funding to go into all of those neighborhoods, even the ones that are not um, profitable. And so that's another way that that system is made more equitable. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, system expansion as well. In Boston, the city has paid for the expansion of the system that's allowed it to quintuple in growth over that period. Um, so a lot of this is the, the private sector, I think, you know, as a private organization, you know, we understand that if we don't have an equitable solution, we're not going to be around. The city is going to see value in us. Uh, so we are doing our best. But when we can partner and both invest public and private funds towards equity, that's where we definitely see across the world much bigger returns in terms of equitable uh, micromobility. And uh, just a couple, so, you know, one more thing that we've been doing lately is I think, I know we have a lot of advocates in the room. Um, we did a resilient streets program where Lyft worked with some of the best streetscape designers around the country um, and advocates in Minneapolis, in Washington, DC, here in Oakland, a couple other cities. And we asked the advocates to say, what street do you really wanna see redesigned? And then we uh, funded the streetscape designers to go in and make these mock-ups of what streets could look like with a better design. So here's a handful of those where they have the latest and greatest kind of crossings and uh, bike lane infrastructure treatments. And this is one that we did um, 
Bike East Bay advised us on this one. This is uh, 9th and East 15th here in Oakland. So this is what it looks like currently. And then, um, you know, we funded some of the planning um, around what it could look like, you know, with some more creative and safe uh, bike infrastructure. So those are some of the ways that we're working towards this. And I think, you know, one of the reasons we're doing work like this is because we as a company are really invested in seeing the safe infrastructure in the same way advocates are. It's one place where we really have overlapping goals. You know, we need, we need the safe infrastructure for the business. Um, cities need it uh, for proper mobility. Citizens need it to be safe. Um, it's, it's, I think, an area where we can really work together. Um, and so this is some of the work we're trying to do towards that end. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Um, we're doing questions at the end, right? Yeah, okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. I have to follow that. <laughs> Great job, Colin. Um, you said you're middle-aged. I'm middle-aged. You're young. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, great to be with you, uh, uh, Paul White. I, um, I ran a group in New York City for many years called Transportation Alternatives. You hope you've heard of it. And um, I've also been involved with an organization that Colin um, has been involved with called the Institute for Transportation and, Devel and Development Policy, ITDP. It's a mouthful. Um, but UC Davis, uh, what a tremendous institution. I remember when I was an intern in 1997 uh, at ITDP, I was packing up copies of Sustainable Transport Magazine to send to Dan Sperling and his class. And um, what an honor that was that like stuff I wrote would be, you know, shared there, but still such a, um, a fountain of, of, of wisdom. And um, in speaking of uh, wisdom, um, there's a number of folks here in the room that I adore, but um, Regina couldn't be with us today, which is a bummer because Populous is just doing tremendous work. Um, one of the things we're working with Populous on, I should say, so super pedestrian, we do shared e-scooters, we're in like 60 cities. We operate a fleet here in, here in Oakland. How many folks have maybe ridden our scooters? All right. Um, you know, I'm a biker too, and I really didn't come to the scooter world um, until after it had already gotten going. But like, if I have one message for you today, it's just, just how the question and a message. The question is really how can micromobility and shared e-scooter companies learn from the great work that the bike movement has done? And I'm just so inspired when leaders like Dave Snyder and many others are embracing micromobility scooters and figuring out how to grow the movement. Because right now it, it might be a little bit similar to 1973, right? When gas prices were going through the roof and people were looking for alternatives and groups like Transportation Alternatives and SFBC were getting founded. And so if we're doing our job as micromobility companies, we are activating all of these new people who are coming to share micromobility and maybe never even ridden a bike before, right? So like, that's um, what I wanna talk about. I was gonna tell you about this Colbert show thing that they did last night, but I'll skip it. It's kind of funny. Um, you can check it out. Um, well, he was making fun of our name, Super Pedestrian. So he was like, he was talking about this new safety feature that we have that keeps scooters off sidewalks, you know, and um, keeps riders, you know, new riders in particular from like endangering themselves and, um, he said, super pedestrian, that's like the Marvel character that no one cares about. Or, <laughs> or, <laughs> and so we were having a little fun with that. Um, and I know my colleagues, my former colleagues at Bird, have no stranger to being pilloried in the media. But, you know, I, I think scooters have sort of had their, had their um, hard knocks and maybe we've gone through some hazing. Um, and I think, like, there's now really, I think, a focus on how can we better serve cities? How can we you know, raise the bar for safety for everyone. And um, so I'm gonna talk about my survey here in a second, and then I'll shut up. But, um, but first, I just wanted to say one more thing about um, a gentleman who's in the audience, Peter Jacobson. So <laughs> when, I, when I started it, when I started at Transportation Alternatives in 2004, Charlie Komanoff and I did a bike ride up to the Croton Reservoir. We went through the Rockefeller Estate and we were sitting there by the banks of the Croton Reservoir. If, if any of you have ridden around there, it's beautiful. And I had a lot to learn as a young-ish advocate. And Charlie's just legendary, right? I mean, he just like pretty much started the movement in New York City. And um, he was like, 
giving me some advice. And he said, you know, the one thing you should really focus on, don't get too defensive when you're trying to advocate, just get the numbers up, do whatever you can to like, just grow the number of people who are out there on two wheels. And he's, he's like, do you know about PJ's law? And I'm like, what's PJ's law? You know, I, I did take college physics, but I never learned PJ's law. And Peter Jacobson's law is basically like every time you triple the ambient number of vulnerable people out there, you're having the crash rate. And it's a revelation. And once people start to get that, you know, everything that makes more people bike is a safety intervention, right? And it's just, <laughs> yes. Helmet laws, for example, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but what, what, a, what a beautiful thing. And um, we really took that as far as we could, I think, in New York. But um, speaking of helmet laws, you know, Seattle just repealed theirs, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> and um, we're, we're very proud. We've served Seattle for, gosh, over a year now. We have, I think, 2,000 scooters in Seattle doing very well there. You know, there's, it's hilly and our scooters are really good on the hills. Um, and our demographics are pretty similar to yours, Colin. Um, I'll talk about that in a second and what we can do to change that. But um, so we did this great big rider survey recently. We gave people $5 of wallet bonus to encourage them to take the survey in Seattle. And we did this survey for a number of reasons. I mean, we do it for like self-interested reasons as a company trying to make a profit. We're trying to uncover insights that we can use in further RFP applications for other cities, um, things that might you know, help us understand why people are choosing our scooter. Um, but really my interest is primarily in like, how can we activate scooter riders, right? Because they're having that experience that we've all had of like substandard infrastructure and why, why should I be risking my life just to like, you know, get to work, you know? And, and people don't understand advocacy inherently. We all understand it. But a lot of people who are new to being out there on car oriented streets just don't get that it can be better. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is just the way it is. And so turning people on in, in that regard has a lot to do with interacting with them and like meeting them where they are in terms of their own advocacy journey, I guess. Um, you know, we as operators have a responsibility for rider safety first and foremost. And so, you know, Super Pedestrian was spun out of MIT and we, you know, engineer and design our own scooters to be super safe. But um, this is what I wanted to talk about because we're seeing just tremendous demand in scale right now. Like our numbers are just through the roof. Um, and people are telling us that it's largely because what they're seeing with, with gas prices and you know, just everything being more expensive. And so, you know, our equity program in, in Seattle is actually really popular. I think we do like, I, I, I don't want to tell you the absolute number, but uh, something like 30% of our trips are you know, beginning or ending in one of the, you know, equity zones. And so um, we're very proud of that, but we have a long way to go. And also just thinking about how we can leverage this gas price moment to win even more people over to micromobility. Already we're serving, uh, this is actually from San Diego where um, most of our riders are below median income in San Diego. So Colin, you talked about exploding some of the myths about you know, our ridership. And in terms of trip purpose, I think too, there's this sense that people are riding scooters just for fun. And there's, you know, there's some of that going on, but you know, there's a lot of work commutation there's a lot of like meeting up with, with friends and social networking, which is of course as important as, as, as anything else in life um, and shopping, of course. And this is interesting. So 17.8% are taking that trip primarily to get to a bus or a train station. So this is like the first and last mile, but for low income riders in San Diego, that this is twice as much. So it's like 34 if I'm doing my math right, 35% of trips among low-income riders. Brian's like, you're close, not quite. Um, so I think that's really telling. And if, on equity, I think the most important thing is if we, if we run our service like a transit service and we're integrating with transit services as, as we are with BART and others through like in-app integrations and like physically putting our scooters near transit stops, we'll be doing a much better job. So this is um, what people want to see in terms of safety. And if you add up, you know, more bike lanes, protected bike lanes, water, wider bike lanes, 
far and away, people understand scooter riders, of course, that um, infrastructure improvements are, are the name of the game. Um, and this is what I'll end on. We're very proud of our partnership in Los Angeles with the LACBC. And if you were on the earlier panel, you saw me um, talk about this a little bit. And Alejandra um, certainly knows much more about it. And I think Alejandra is actually in this photograph. Um, but the Fix Sunset campaign is really reminds me of some of the campaigns back in the day in New York City, like the you know Queens Boulevard campaign and some of our first protected bike lane campaigns. And it's just a beautiful thing to see more of our riders getting turned on, getting politicized, joining LACBC. And that's really what I'm focused on in Super Pedestrian. Like, how can we get these riders joining their local advocacy groups, showing up for meetings, writing letters, doing all the things that we know is the only way to, to change the streetscape. So looking forward to the Q&A. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lee. Wow, you guys. So if you guys are middle-aged, that must make me like, I don't know, much older. Okay, and ho hopefully a little bit wiser, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. So uh, on that note, okay. Um, I know it's a little bit warmer here. So I thought we'd start off with a little picture from uh, my hometown, which is back in Waterloo, Wisconsin. This is actually, Dave, this is where your brother's bike was built back in 1976. So what's unique about my being up here with this great panel is we're the only true bike share company on the panel. Everybody else is kind of a, a blend of bikes, scooters, or your scooters themselves. So just a little bit of perspective. We are part of Trek Bicycle Corporation, which was founded back at 76. And I can't wait to see pictures of that bike. And um, always harkens back to kind of our hum humble roots and the like. So B-Cycle, we, um, we've been around since 2010, which is a lot of years in this space. And Many of you may know us from some of the systems we launched back in uh, Denver, Colorado, all the way back in April of 2010, and then shortly thereafter in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And um, we were a kiosk-based station, uh, a dock-based platform that uh, really, we, we set out to change the world. And here we are in 2022, and micromobility is like a really, really important thing in all of our communities. I'm going to keep it real high level in terms of the types of things that we've done. We, you know, we've been at this since 2010, and we've had a number of different types of approaches to how do we engage with our individual communities. What's unique about B-Cycle is most of our communities are independent operators to bike share programs. So the data that they, uh, they capture, the programs that they set up, those kind of re that, that's their property. But we do share, we're unique in having what we call B-Cycle World, where we bring our operators in, and we're sharing peer-to-peer -peer examples of what uh, different programs have been doing. So back in 2010, we actually did a program with the Housing Authority in Denver to allow access to the program. And that moved the needle a little bit. And every time we do something, it, it advances things. But I'm going to lead into two things that have really changed the landscape over the last couple of years. Um, we got looped into finding different ways to access the program in Milwaukee and in, in, uh, actually in Fargo, North Dakota, if you can believe it, was the first time we actually had a, a university student access card as the means of access to bike share. At one time, Fargo was generating over 10 rides per bike per day on big, heavy acoustic B-cycle bikes, and it was just awesome. 2015, we launched in Philadelphia, and that's where we launched with the first cash-based program to provide access to a program for those that were unbanked in the city of Philadelphia. And then more recently, down in LA, the tap card integration, you know, providing access to a, a, a transit pass. And then most recently, working with Transit App, uh, now in, uh, in Las Vegas, you can actually use their, their software platform to access their light rail, their bus system, and their bike share program. In the last 12 months, and this really came out of the, the, you know, the, the last couple of years, starting in Omaha, working with the Better Bike Share Partnership, they actually funded the ability to check out a B-Cycle membership card at your local library and have access to the program again. So we're, we're always looking for new and different ways to kind of leverage access to the program and the like. We are and continue to be a station-based uh, program. And 
As you'll see here, we've really shrunk the footprint. We've gone from these very large stations down to a small individual docks. We feel that this provides security in the neighborhood for the bikes, but it also provides more importantly for the user, predictability and access to a system and the like. Today, we are in a number of different programs, but as you see with the red dots, those are the ones, and this is really where we're seeing something that's moving the needle, and that's electrification. So the red dots are those communities that have gone 100% e-bike. And, and with that, over the last couple of years, you know, we all saw, I think speaking for everyone in the group here, we all did see kind of a drop in ridership back in March of 2020. And then within six weeks, we saw just a huge increase in ridership. And I think one of the points I want to leave with you today is the fact that electrification is really what is making a huge difference in our communities. And if we can provide easier means of access to these programs, meet the riders in their individual communities with a program that gives them access to that, it will change their lives and it'll change all of our businesses and the like. The other thing that's really happening is the move to mobile apps. And I'm going to just kind of take you right to the, the, the key point. Going into COVID, we had about 20% of our access through the mobile app. Last year it was over 70% and actually year to date in 2022, this is now up to 84%. So we're betting big on continuing to do kind of touchless access to our programs. So again, I wanted to keep it really high level and um, I can go back to the picture of the snowy barn if we want, <laughs> but thank you so much. Hello everybody. Thanks for your time today. Yeah, I definitely didn't dress right, did I? <laughs> but. Anyhow, what I wanted to do is introduce you all to BIRD a bit, and just tell a little bit more about BIRD because a lot of people don't realize that uh, we're not just a micromobility shared service company. We also do offer consumer products. So we're selling e-bikes today. Uh, you can find them at bike shops all around the world, as well as we operate bike share and e-scooters. But walking through today, we're gonna talk a bit about our vehicle evolution, what safety features we have, a bit about accessible vehicles. That's something that sometimes gets overlooked but it's something that I'm pretty passionate about. I think micromobility and just ride share in general isn't always a one size fits all solution. You know, it takes different products for different people. And then uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the partnerships we have globally. That being said, uh, I, you know, this is just our mission statement, but it really what it's talking about is removing car traffic and reducing carbon emissions. And it's something that uh, Bird has been doing since 2018. And, you know, for myself, you know, I've been in micromobility geez now about 20 years. I uh, did a startup called T3. I used to run Segway in North America for six years. So, you know, that last mile of transportation has always been near and dear to my heart. So joining Bird, you know, it was a way to continue that mission. From that perspective and that mission, you know, we started in 2018. Uh, we did a bit of rogue launching. I think people know that, but at the same time, we really disrupted the industry in terms of how people thought about micromobility and, and transportation in general. But from that perspective, what we really leaned in on is developing in-house technology. And, you know, like super pedestrian, you know, we've developed in-house and uh, we have over hundred engineers on staff from, you know, aerospace companies to automotive companies. But by developing scooters and bicycles, what we've been able to do is bring that tech and really implement new safety standards. Well, if I talk a bit about our bird three and you know, I'm not gonna make this too technical, but what a lot of people don't know is there's over 200 sensors in our scooter and six accelerometers. So what that allows you to do is do really cool things like sidewalk detection. So imagine now with really accurate GPS, you can detect when a, where a sidewalk is, slow a vehicle down, stop it. It just really creates a better safe environment for riders as well as bicycle riders. And really it's about the pedestrian at the end of the day. That being said, we also have very redundant systems. So imagine now we have a three brake system on our scooters and our bicycles. So you have a front and rear brake. And then with our throttle, just giving you a small example, uh, it's a dual wiper blade. So if it fails and the brakes fail, the engine brake will kick in and it actually slows you down. So we're trying to do things to really create a safer rider experience in terms of the way we implement technology. But the neat thing is when you start looking at innovation around technology, 
Uh, imagine our GPS now is accurate within 10 centimeters. Well, the way we do this is with sensor fusion technology. So by introducing the sensor fusion microchip that we developed with U-Blocks, we can now monitor our fleets at geofences. And really how it works is we take GPS preloads, we take a sensor fusion chip, and then we take the, the GPS data and combine them all. So something that's called dead reckoning. So imagine, you know, when you're driving your car, I think people get frustrated sometimes because your GPS isn't exactly accurate, you're off by a street. Well, with this, it has something called dead reckoning. So you can preload maps. It takes like the position of the scooter. Earlier, I talked about the sensors in the vehicle. Imagine now it knows the direction you're moving, the distance, the speed, and it can combine that data with the last known GPS coordinates and it's accurate within 10 centimeters. Well, that, allows us to have very safe detection around sidewalks, set geofences, things to that nature. So earlier I talked about accessible vehicles. You know, this panel, you know, your, your panel's as good as the, the companies that are here. And <laughs> I also really think, you know, associations are the same way. Well, with BIRD, it's no different. I wanted to make sure we had one of the best in class accessible vehicle programs in the industry. And the way to do that is take companies that are already operating in the space and take their learnings. So this company, Scoot Around, uh, they're owned by a company named Will. They have 750 dealers across the United States. But now imagine if you're traveling to a city and somebody needs a power chair or a wheelchair, it's a white glove service. You can go into our app, you can select a rental. Now the device will get delivered to that person. They'll give training, explain how it works. They'll, they'll actually deliver it. And then when they're done, they'll come pick it up. Well, even the better thing is we talked about equity a bit and Bird actually subsidizes this service. So we cap it in each market to a daily amount, but you can rent a power chair for $5. So if somebody needs it, they have access to it. We also have equity programs for our scooters. I mean, healthcare workers pay zero when they ride a bird, college students, 50% discount. So we do a lot in communities to make sure that we have equitable offers. That being said, when we talk about what types of transit partnerships we have in Nashville, I thought this was pretty cool because we were able to work with local transport, uh, tra local transportation companies and define where to drop our scooters. And by analyzing that data, we were able to create what we call nests. Everything's got a bird pun, sorry. Uh, it's really where our parking corrals are. But by putting that, we were able to integrate that last mile of transportation quite well. And we're also offering for students, again, discounts and, and really trying to create an, a way that's a very, it's a very affordable transportation system. So imagine with discounts in Nashville, you can take a bus ride for like $1.60 and a scooter ride for like $1.50. So your, your full trip is under $5. That being said, uh, we've also incorporated quite a bit in bike share. Uh, a lot of people think about bird and they think just scooters, but if you're in San Diego or Rome, uh, we have alternatives. So if you look on the map, you'll notice uh, the bicycle. Well, these are again, <clears throat> incorporated bike infrastructure companies that are on our app. So it's a one location. Again, too, we subsidize some of the rentals. So by using Bird as like a one-stop shop in certain markets, you can have access to e-bikes, bikes, accessible vehicles, scooters, whatever the need may be. That being said, I kind of blew through this, but uh, it's late, hot, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them at the end. Thanks. Um, there we go. Hi, everyone. I realized I didn't introduce myself earlier, uh, but I get the chance to do that now. My name is Yauke. I'm here um, as a graduate student from UC Davis. Um, I'm also here partially because I'm working with CalBike. Um, we found a partnership while I was working on my thesis, um, and they're very uh, excited to work on creating an environment that allows for equitable uh, micromobility. So I'm here on behalf of uh, UC Davis, but we're also working with very closely with California Bicycle Coalition. I wanted to start with this image. It's very heavy, but I think it's a very good image to start with when we're talking about things like equity in transportation, right? Um, so when we talk about active transportation, I'm also an active transportation uh, advocate. Um, we tend to talk about the fun things and the things that get us excited, uh, but it's also good to realize that people very much rely on biking and on active transportation. In this case, this is a photo of the current situation uh, north of the capital. 
uh, Kiev in Ukraine, uh, where people are literally biking through the rubble of the war on their bicycles, just to realize, you know, we're not just talking about recreation here. We're also talking about very serious things. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much. I used to be an engineer, found my way into the social sciences. I'm currently at UC Davis. I, I'm originally Dutch. You can probably hear that from my accent, uh, but I won't get into that too much. We don't have a lot of time and I have a lot of slides. Uh, and I do want to give you guys time to get into the Q&A. I think this slide for me is very important. It's also something that Colin mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, we're talking about social equity in micromobility. And as you can see, uh, there's a lot of uh, men uh, sitting here and a lot of white men sitting here. Um, I think it's good to acknowledge, you know, some of our positionalities and biases when we're talking about these topics, right? And this is not something we typically do. Uh, we do that in research. We do acknowledge our positionality when we do research on these types of topics. But I think it would be great if we do these presentations that we include these types of uh, slides to acknowledge this when we're talking about this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the complexity of social equity. And with that, I highlighted uh, intersectionality, which basically means that we are not one thing or another, right? We're not man or, or women. Um, some of us are also identifying as non-binary, uh, but we are also other things, right? We are also people from different places in the world. We are people with different experiences. Some people have experienced trauma. And I think something very important and very challenging when we're addressing equity uh, issues in micromobility is that it's very hard to distinguish these things when we're doing things like surveys. And I think I'm gonna talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, standardization of surveying is something that's very complicated, right? And there's a lot of different operators here uh, sitting in this panel. Uh, and some of these companies are doing surveys on social equity, but it's very hard to also compare data because we don't have a lot of standardization in the industry. And that's something that we're gonna look at as well. Um, but intersectionality, so far, a lot of things that I've been looking at are off the record. I'm still pending IRB review, uh, but seems to be one of the most important things when we're talking about equity, because it's not mentioned in the publications. It's not mentioned when we talk about social equity. So keeping in mind, things are not, you know, uh, that simple when we're talking about uh social equity, it's a lot more complex and intersectionality is gonna play a very important role in the future looking at social equity. So what I'm doing is a thesis on bridging the gap uh, between government and the private sector uh, to better serve disadvantaged communities. And I started out with Dave and Kelbike talking about, can we do something for people in terms of social equity uh, within microbility, looking at shared scooter and shared bike services in California. And we basically discovered that there are a lot of things we need to look at prior to, you know, starting with a pilot program or starting with providing, uh, you know, another economic center for people to, to enroll into these, um, into these types of systems. Um, so that's what our research is really going to focus on. Uh, and I think to really quickly mention this, my first understanding when I got into micromobility, uh, being Dutch, um, was slightly different. Um, I was familiar with a system that started in 2003 called the OV feet, which stands for Open Bar for Four uh, Feet, and that literally means in Dutch, translated to English, public transportation bicycle. So that was my knowledge of micromobility when I got into this field, I found out that we're not really talking about public transportation when we're talking about shared uh, bikes and shared scooter services. Um, so that's where I needed to reevaluate a little bit where we're currently at with micromobility. Um, I also referred to the operators a lot as TNCs and I found out I cannot do that, right? TNC, so for those of you who don't know what that is, it's the uh, transportation network corporations. Currently in the legislation or the way it's written, we're, when we're talking about transportation network corporations, we're really looking at automobile uh, focused uh, operators and industries. And I think that's something where 
uh, these operators who are sitting here at this panel uh, should be included when we're talking about transportation network corporations, um, because currently we're just saying service providers, uh, but they're doing a lot. They're doing a lot more than that. They're really involved in the entire operation uh, of these systems. Um, so that's something that you know I had to reevaluate as well and kind of take a step back. Um, I put some images here of the. Uh, trolley systems back in you know the 1930s uh, those transitioned from being private to public I'm not going to compare the current state of micro mobility to doing the same thing right I'm not saying we're going to to transform all these uh, bike and scooter systems into something that's government owned but I do think we're at a very interesting point right now where the collaboration between government and the private sector uh, is getting complex, but it's also getting very interesting. And that's why we're doing this research. I'll go through this really quick because I'm taking too much time. Uh, but currently the, resp the responsibilities of, of these service providers are quite a lot, right? They're addressing uh, social equity issues, um, but they are uh, having to spend a lot of uh, money on that as well. And that's where um, I've talked to some of the uh, service providers also off record. I'm still pending IRB review. Um, and they're saying we need more funding, right? We need more money to be able to do some of these things and to actually address some of these issues. Um, and in some cases, they're saying we need more help from government. Uh, but of course, uh, that gets very complicated uh, as well. I think something that's really important to recognize is that the service providers are not the solution to solving all of our problems in the built environment. They have not created them. They have existed prior to these micro mobility service providers being here, being at the table, uh, but they are a tool uh, or means to an end. And that's where we can embrace the partnerships with the operators and service providers, work better with them, to undo some of the injustice uh, and some of the issues we've um, created um, when it comes to uh, being equitable in the built environment. Some deliberate and some not deliberate. Uh, lots of issues to solve there. So I put this quote here. I won't read it out loud. Uh, you guys can see it. I think what's really important here is that uh, we could recognize uh, these micro mobility services as a form of public transportation, or at least have some kind of conversation around this, right? Because we are talking about a lot of issues in the built environment and we're trying to address these, but we, we probably would need public money to address those, which comes with a lot of um, public responsibilities as well. Uh, so these are some of the things that the operators are currently already doing. I won't name all of them because there's a lot. Um, but it includes reducing the risk, providing universal basic transportation services. There's a lot of pilot programs. There's a lot of rethinking enforcement. Uh, a lot of these companies are providing GPS data and we are really in the transportation industry, uh, the pioneer in providing open data. And I think that's a very important point as well, right? Sharing data uh, and being transparent is also a part of uh, being equitable. Uh, and these are some of the things that could still change or where we have more opportunity uh, to do a little bit more. So using the data to reshape our cities, um, linking these to social programs. Colin talked about things like uh, food stamps, you know, making it easier for people to enroll into these systems, I think is a huge key point of providing um, equitable uh, programs. And I think that's where we also need to have those conversations um, and it's, it's not always that easy, right? It's, we all know that uh, these processes can be very slow, uh, but these are conversations that uh, we need to continue uh, to have. I had some images for some conversation, but I won't go through all of them. Uh, also for sake of time, sorry, that link was the one that ended up, we have Paul here from Super Pedestrian with all the fallen uh, scooters. Um, but at least they did have a lot of scooters, which allowed people to ride in groups, which a car could have swerved there or somebody deliberately knocked them over. But the point is, uh, there are still some, you know, some obvious issues, some issues that you can recognize in the streets, right? With scooters laying around, bicycles not being in their, in their docks, if they're docked systems. 
Um, but there's also a lot of issues that we don't see. And that's the one that we want to focus on. Who is not using these systems? Who's not benefiting from these systems? Uh, and I think I just wanted to show off my photograph skills. On this image right here, you know, people can create their own uh, ways to make public transportation or micromobility services cheaper, right? Standing with two people on one scooter is maybe not the way we're supposed to ride these uh, scooters, but it is cheaper than riding with one person. Um, so only focusing on economic incentives, you know, is something that we don't necessarily need to do. There's a lot of other things we can do. And I think listening to the community uh, is one thing. These are my own photos, just wanted to highlight that. Uh, and then just an overview, this is what we're doing. We're doing some empirical literature analysis, analysis and we're also doing expert interviews. And that's where I would like to invite any of you, if you feel very strongly about this topic, um, feel free to send me an email, feel free to contact Cal Bike. Um, of course, there's some things uh, that we have to um, comply with since this is gonna be IRB approved, it's gonna be anonymous, um, but I would love to have your input on how we can make micromobility more equitable. And then I'll end with this quote. Uh, I used a quote from one of my fa favorite urban planners. My background is in urban planning. Uh, an endless number of green buildings don't make a sustainable city. And in our case, an endless number of equitable solutions don't make shared micromobility necessarily equitable. And that was a funny photo. We don't want these scooters to end up behind dumpsters because then nobody can use them, right? Um, so these are, these are some things that we need to work on. Thank you so much. So and that said, we'll go into the Q and A. Uh, I'm sure you guys have lots of questions. I also realized it's very hot, <laughs> so if you guys want to take a take a breather, uh, feel free to do so. Um, I think do we have? Do, shall we start with the online questions? If we have any of those, no, not yet. Okay, let's do the in person uh, questions first. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> um, hi, I'm Michelle. Uh, I don't know how to phrase this question, but oh, I don't like seeing myself up there. <laughs> Weird. Okay. Um, I'm curious, and all of you can answer this, and it's also kind of a funny question because I'm asking a panel of men about this thing. Um, but Colin, you mentioned that you have low ridership or I guess slightly low ridership for female or women uh, riding uh, Lyft. I don't know if you have others have data on that. I'm curious if you know why. Um, I'm also gonna make a small assumption. And so this is like a multifold question, I'm sorry. Um, and I'm not here to start a helmet debate, but I'm curious if any of the ride shares provide helmets. I don't typically use the scooters, so I don't know if they do. And if not, why not? And do you think that contributes? And just, I'm asking that as a woman who likes to wear a bike helmet. So curious just about all your thoughts about female ridership, about safety, about providing safety precautions. Any thoughts? Thanks. Second, there we go. Um, yeah, awkward question since we are only, our female yeah, panelist wasn't able to make it and would um, in many ways be more qualified to answer. Um, so yeah, uh, I think our slideshow, we have about 40% of our ridership is female. Um, obviously it'd be about 50, it'd be 50% if it was fully equitable gender wise. Um, I, I do know that that is observed both through shared bikes and I, I believe actually the proportion of women riding like like if you just went out and did a count anywhere in the country it'd be a little bit lower than that so in some cases bike share has improved you know you could say bike share has improved the gender gap in cycling uh, i think we've probably seen that in in like all of these shared technologies because again you don't need to own you don't need to identify as a cyclist and own a bike uh, for that but there's still um uh you know obviously a gap to make up why um i've read lots of different things about it um, you, you know, I don't know if there's like a, if, if there's like a, you know, I'd be curious to hear other, you know, your thoughts, other people's thoughts. Um, I think oftentimes there's, I can tell you like a couple issues I've heard. And one is, um, physical security, you know, like 
safety perceptions are different for men and women, both for the practice of cycling, but also just for being in public space. Um, so that's, I think, one part of it. Um, you know, I think I've also heard that, uh, you know, there's different norms around, like, can you show up at work sweaty or, um, you know, dress and things like that, you know, for commuting um, that might affect some people. Um, so I think there's, uh, you know, I'll, and then actually I'll, um, another one is uh, women, I think, are oftentimes tasked with trip chaining or the types of trips, like many women don't just go to work, they drop kids off or run, you know, um, women often, I think, make more trip chain trips. That's like a data point. And if you're doing that, a bike, sh bike share might be more difficult, might not carry the things you need to carry. Um, and so, you know, those could all be factors there. Um, and then your question about helmets, um, you know, I, I, I bike shared here, brought my own helmet. Um, I often do that. Uh, there, I think bike, you know, and it gets to actually the point that uh, Paul raised and, 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 you know, Peter's rule where um, the bike, bike share rules, or I'm sorry, helmet laws can really discourage people. They make you feel like they, they position, I think, the act of cycling as an inherently unsafe activity. Um, and, you know, it's also like one more piece of gear you need. Um, so I think those things can dissuade cycling. And when you dissuade cycling, you actually make it less safe. So it's... But if you provided a helmet... Why well, we don't provide. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, we don't. Um, it's difficult. I've, I've seen a couple models where they've tried it, and like Seattle, which that bike share system ultimately went under. Um, and I think Australia also has helmet laws. And bike share there has been, you know, I don't think there's any bike shares in Australia that have kind of anywhere near the ridership we would need to, to keep on going here. So I'll pass it's it just on. That, sorry, just to clarify, it's just that people don't want to wear a helmet or if there's a helmet provided, they don't want to use bike share we, or it's just not, it doesn't make sense. Like people aren't using them no matter what. Yes. yes okay. No. Right. So we have a couple programs at Bird. Uh, we, we give away a free helmet to anybody that wants one. So you can go in the app and just register and get them. We also have a lot of community engagement in every city that we work in. We, I think just in San Diego alone last year, we gave away 10,000 helmets, just to give you a reference. Uh, when you talk about making the helmet like attached to the scooter, there are some cities that do it. Uh, in Tel Aviv, we have a, a flourishing you know, ride share business and we actually have a lock on it and a helmet. So. It's all Bluetooth connected. When you start your ride, you know, it requires the helmet. Every city's different. Regs are different all around the world. The other thing that has been happening lately that we've noticed is like in the city of Miami, uh, we have what's called the helmet selfie. So we've actually written AI into uh, our app. So they're going to, in order to start the ride, you have to hold up your phone. It looks at you and it actually knows if you have a helmet on or not. And it will not start the ride without it. So there's certain things cities are doing to include it. I know that's around scooters. Bicycles is a little bit different, uh, but regulations are different in every market. That's what we've noticed. But I guess maybe just to give the, the bicycle perspective, uh, there's been a number of different uh, attempts at providing helmets over the years. Probably the most famous is the one up in, in Seattle where you picked up a clean helmet in one basket. And when you got done with your ride, you dropped it in another basket. It was a significant operational challenge. And when you've got a big head like mine, those helmets didn't fit. So it sat up on the top of my head. Um, being, being with a bike company, we're, we do a lot of messaging on our bikes, on our apps. Uh, like Brian was saying, we also, in a lot of our uh, programs, we will have an activation program where if you sign up for access, you get a free, uh, a free helmet and the likes. We, we definitely encourage ridership. Um, messaging that we have been putting out has people in, in photos with helmets. But having a helmet at each bike, um, if I've got up, come off that bike, I've been riding for half an hour, I'm a pretty lathered up, you're probably not gonna wanna grab my helmet and put it on your head. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Paul? Oh, I guess I'll be the last white guy to comment on that question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I think maybe the, maybe the best thing I can say is, is to point you to Sarah Kaufman at NYU, who's been doing amazing um, research and um, just, drawing more awareness to the pink tax, to the gender gap, just, you know, the whole intersection of, you know, gender and transportation. And um, I think it was her research. And we also did some of this at Transportation Alternatives, where you see what happens when you build a proper bike facility and you get 
gender parity like you might see in Amsterdam or other places where, you know, and it may also be true. I'm just going to take a leap of faith here and utter a what might be a gross stereotype, but it might be true that men are more prone to disregard their own safety or maybe not be as susceptible to other kinds of like dangers as, as, <laughs> yeah. And so, so yeah, I think, I think infrastructure, I think um, to, to, to Colin, to your point about trip chaining and the dual role that women often play as heads of household and breadwinners and having to do a lot of trips, we're finding that our past programs, like, so if we give people like ride all you want for like a day or whatever, you see more gender parity there. And then I think too, just, you know, hiring women, you know, elevating women in positions of leadership. You know, I report to this amazing um, woman, Haya, who I actually used to work with at Bird, and now we're both at Super Pedestrian. And um, there's a cultural, there's a cultural, I think, shift. And, you know, Jeanette Sadat Khan, who I worked with a lot in New York City, has, I think, done a lot to like change the culture in transportation, which is a very male dominated field. And now if you look at the women in positions of power, like in Jersey City, Barca Patel, is doing amazing protected bike lanes throughout Jersey City, and you see parity. You know, we're getting closer. Thank you for that question. Um, any other questions? Right here. Yeah, there's two over here. All right, we'll start over here. Just have a question for Bird, which is I don't think you mentioned why, but I'm curious why uh, you guys are adding bikes to the fleet when you guys were basically the, the genesis of scooters. Great question. So imagine like last mile transportation is a bullseye chart and you look at the very middle of it, it's that last mile. Well, there's needs for different different distances. So when you start looking at the next ring, it's like three to five miles. You look at the next ring, it might be five to, you know, five to 25 miles, whatever it is. But what we looked at is one, we, we, yeah, we operate in over 400 cities around the world, but we realized that there's a definite need for greater distances. And in addition to that, we realized we couldn't operate everywhere, but how do we bring our mission forward? So we started developing products we can sell and we developed consumer products and sold those. And then in terms of bicycles, we realized, you know, with our user base, we just in the US, we have about 20 million subscribers. And we realized that there was in, in surveying them, there was a request to go to greater distances. And uh, we started inter introducing bicycles as a result. Uh, but now we have bicycles in multiple cities in the US and Europe and Tel Aviv, quite a different few different places now. Quick follow up is, do you see a difference in the rider profiles between your scooters and your bikes? Yeah, I didn't really comment on the gender differences. Uh, Bird, we're about 46% female now in terms of a ridership on, on e-scooters. Uh, maybe something has to do with our helmet giveaways, I don't know. But we do market quite heavily to all genders. and. You know, on the bicycle side, it's still early data, but it, it's definitely uh, more male than female. Yeah. What about income level? On the income side, I'm not, I, I actually haven't seen the data on the bicycles yet, but on the scooter side, uh, the average medium income was below 50,000 is what we noticed. Good questions. Uh, first of all, yeah, I see what you mean about being on the screen. It's a weird feeling. <laughs> Um, th th it was awesome. a great, it was a great exchange about, about the gender piece a minute ago. It made me think to last night's m short film, uh, Viking while black and just particularly like the fear of being profiled and over-policed, keeping black people in the context of the film from biking, like as widely or as much as they otherwise want to. And it just made me think, I know this may not feel like a natural fit, but do your companies, or do you think they will have any kind of role in the advocacy space around like um, police trainings about profiling. Cause right, I, I can see it indirectly feeding into larger ridership, which is of course sort of like the business case for what's a pretty social like and kind of the human rights issue. But like, is, is that any kind of internal talk in any of your companies? Cause I could see it, you know, being a link. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll start and then add around. So with operating permits, as you start setting up, you know, bike share and ride share in general, uh, there's usually a commercial offer element. And a lot of what we do is offer the city's options in terms of what we're going to do in community engagement. 
and a lot of the things you just mentioned, we do offer, but we also want to be meaningful to the community and make sure that, you know, not only are we giving free rides, but we're building infrastructure. So we do do that. We also are, we, we have very good guidelines at Bird in terms of diversity hiring. That's something that, you know, we, we practice and, you know, we talk about inclusivity in terms of our company, you know, you need different voices and different points of view when, when you're making decisions. And that's something that we practice quite well, like from hiring to making financial decisions to what cities we're going to roll out to what investments we're going to make in equity or community involvement. But that's a little bit from Bird. Maybe I'll pass it. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think good question and, and it's a difficult topic. Um, I think the you know, Lyft, I can say, understands kind of the space that it's in. Um, in terms of, you know, putting these vehicles on the street, trying to both, um, you know, reach communities of color, um, as well as other underserved communities. Um, and, you know, both to improve the equity of, uh, of who uses uh, the scooter, also, um, you know, also how the, the the face of the company is and uh, and who are who are hiring um, you know I, th I think like as we saw um, you know many events uh, of the last year you know Lyft has tried to activate um, you know around um, convey messages of support to to communities of color um, you know in terms of policing which I think your question got to um, it's not something that I think we are, we are, you know, we we have very like direct interaction with. Um, but for instance, you know, when micro mobility often faces issues of theft, uh, for instance, um, we work very closely with, you know, very closely with police departments when we can to, uh, you know, we're kind of wary of using enforcement strategies. Um, you know, that that's been like something that we try to be very mindful of. You know, when we do have a theft problem that, um, you know, there wouldn't, we wouldn't see enforcement in that, you know, like we, we wouldn't want there to be heavy enforcement by police there um, because we, we understand some of the, the trip ups that happen um, and, and some of the unfairness uh, in the way that, that police enforce, um, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm kind of not really sure what else uh, to add there. Did you mean like, you know, are, are you thinking of when people ride, whether they're pulled over by police more often? Yeah, I mean, that was more, um, more what the film talked about. You know, like, it's great to have a five, the $5 a year fee, but if I'm afraid I'm going to stop by police, like, the dollar amount doesn't matter, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, is that kind of a different... Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's, that's what I... That's yeah, what I right, like, like the phenomenon of, like, biking while Black. Um, you know, I don't think we found a great way. I think we understand that as an issue. I don't think we found a great way to, like, interact or improve on it um but but it's something we're aware of and and you know something that i think as a community i'm not sure like we can fully solve that but i think as a community it's something that we have to be aware of and mindful of anybody else i'll just take a quick uh, quick couple of minutes just to tell you a little bit about what we're doing so you know b cycle got started in 2010 um i think i was employee number two or three uh at that time and in a lot of ways, we're, we're remaking our company. Uh, like Paul said, I actually report to a lady named Morgan Raymaker, who came out of our operations team there in Madison. And she is now tasked with um, basically developing the future of, of B-Cycle. So as an organization, uh, Trek has a very uh, active focus on doing more. Um, I think the, the key thing, every one of our systems really reflects the communities that they're in, whether these are owned by B-Cycle or local uh, organizations. There's always close neighborhood contact that those systems have. And we try and reinforce that from kind of a head office uh, standpoint. But again, it's all about getting as much of the community involved, interacting with local law enforcement alike uh, as much as we can. Um, and again, it's, it, it, it is a challenging area, but you know, we're, we're doing our very, very best to try and understand what the, op the headwinds are and hopefully develop some really positive tailwinds. Paul? Yeah, so uh, I don't know if I have much more to add. Um, it's it work in progress. You know, there have been a couple of really high profile scooting while black incidents. Um, there was one in the UK and I think um, 
one in Hartford a couple of years ago. Um, you know, we're we're trying to be honest about how we engage with the issue and and try to translate that into our hiring practices. You know, the decision we made early on to be a company that would only hire W two employees and not use gig, I think, was a good one in terms of like showing communities that were having a meaningful presence and we actually want to be here for the long term and we want to like you know provide meaningful long-term employment and that's made a difference in a lot of our cities um but yeah it's it's not it's ongoing yeah no, I, I i certainly appreciate the the like complexity and you know no one can solve it fully but everyone has a role you know in their own space so thank you oh, that was a great question uh yeah question over there and i saw we also have online questions Oh, okay. So one of the one of the biggest groups of users of uh, of micro mobility outside of the shared space is uh, commercial cyclists, and uh, you know we see that we saw that in New York um, in, in a huge way, and you see that to a lesser extent here. But people using scooters and electric bikes, um, and there's some organ there's some companies like Zumo and other things that are sort of on the edge of being shared, and I'm wondering if. I mean, I know also that the communities doing that are generally people coming from marginalized communities, poorer people, people of color very often, um, almost never women, but uh, and I'm wondering if that's some uh, uh, demographic that your companies have at all engaged with or have plans to engage with, or if there's just too many barriers there for working with commercial uh, delivery people. No, we, we actively engage in that now. Uh, we, we, we're constantly looking at ways to like give people an opportunity to make a, a very livable wage. So in, in that regard, we like in Europe, we have a very big practice of that right now in terms of the delivery community. Um, in the United States, it hasn't taken off as much, but it's really about the differences in infrastructure in cities too. And if you're operating e-scooters, we talked about, you know, why bikes? Well, one of the reasons that we don't see it in scooters is it's kind of difficult to go five miles away on a scooter with a backpack of food and deliver it. If you're talking food delivery, where in Europe, everything's very centralized and six blocks is not a big deal, but that's what we've noticed. Maybe you have I don't have any metrics, but I, you know, I do know uh, we operate the city of Philadelphia. And uh, again, without a lot of detail, I do know that food delivery, um, many delivery people found it easier to get around on an e-bike. So the uh, pretty high percentage of our initial rent rentals there were people actually checking an e-bike out and using it for, for food delivery. But we really, we, we have we've had a couple of interesting approaches in terms of maybe util utilizing our equipment in that market, but nothing is you know, substantiated yet. Um, so at Lyft, we know that uh, food delivery workers are using the bikes. Um, I think it, especially some of our equity members actually where that's a lower rate. And so they're able to take the bike out and use it. Uh, we don't have a program that specifically works with them. We've looked at it and it didn't seem to really work super well with our vehicle or like our current service plan, just because we're trying to keep the bikes also available to, to the users. Um, but I did uh, San Francisco, the city of San Francisco is doing an e-bike uh, delivery driver pilot program um they are going to be supplying bikes to drivers and i've been kind of con like consulting with them just because we have like op obviously e-bike operations experience so letting them know like okay how are you going to handle battery swaps like how long do you think a shift is um and uh, so I'm, I'm excited to see how that turns out and i think they're going to offer free or very low cost rentals of the e-bikes of a city-owned e-bike fleet so it's sf department of environment that's doing it um, Thank you so much. And we still have some time. Uh, yeah, question in the back, and then we'll then we'll jump to the online questions. Uh, thank you all. I want to acknowledge that no doubt you're all aware of a lot of the original controversies and problems with all of the services and the equipment you've had. I've been following it for many years, having worked 20 years directly in San Francisco and witnessed it. Uh, I don't appreciate what you all have been trying to do to eliminate some of that, but um, it's been brought up already. I think I didn't quite hear exactly what the answer was, but 
will you or do you encourage nonprofits and city agencies to utilize your particular apps, equipment, software, et cetera, perhaps even in a franchise model um, so that they can actually offer e-bikes, scooters, et cetera, micromobility solutions to their communities directly through them. And it was brought up um, libraries, et cetera. I was specifically asked about that from my community. And I'm wondering if you have some sort of a franchisee where the nonprofit slash public agency can operate your systems. Yeah, I can start out. Uh, Lyft does do that. So obviously Lyft operates. Um, so diff there's different operating models. Uh, many of the many of the systems we operate are under like a city name or, and under different types of public private partnerships. So Bay Wheels here is obviously operated by Lyft on Lyft equipment. Um, and in that case, Lyft owns the equipment and operates it. Um, and you know, we have an agreement with the five cities, uh, five of the cities in the Bay Area. Um, maybe one that's a little bit more like what you're thinking of is would be Washington, DC, where the city actually we we obviously developed this the equipment, but we sell it to the city. So the city owns the stations, they own the bikes, um, and then we operate it. And um, you know, these in um, that system, the city is carrying most of the financial risk. So, you know, for instance, COVID hits, re you know, revenue goes way down. Um, in Washington, D.C., uh, the city is carrying that risk. In San Francisco, the operator is. Um, so in Washington, D.C., they've invested more in the system, um, and they're carrying more risk in the system, but that also gives them a higher degree of control over the system. Um, they can make the decisions because they're carrying that risk. Uh, in, a, in a model where you know, Lyft as an operator in the Bay Area carries all the risk, um, you know, we can't we have to, we have more control over how the system's operated because, you know, you generally want who's ever carrying the risk to get kind of control over the operations, right? You couldn't, no business could sign on to operate a system if they didn't have control over how it would be operated. So, um, you know, there's, there's all these different public private models from, you know, there's, there's only a couple systems in the world that are actually publicly owned and operated. Montreal, you could kind of argue is one, although it's not as clear cut as that. There's a couple in China. Most are a, are different types of public-private partnerships, and I think and I'll pass the mic. But um, you know, some of the other models we're in are just permits, where we just have a permit to operate. You know, we can come or go as we please. You know, in, in the Bay Area, we have control over the operations, but we we are here until 2027, um, and we you know we have a contract that requires that and requires certain levels of like 11 different KPIs and service levels that we have to adhere to. So just different tiers of like investment, control, risk. Um. I think um, just to kind of echo what uh, Colin shared with you, that kind of applies to, to the B-Cycle program. We are uh, kind of breaking some of the rules uh, in terms of what we're doing. We uh, actually are currently working with a group down in the San Gabriel Valley, uh, down near Los Angeles. And uh, they, uh, the, Council of Governments there, uh, SGV COG, uh, was able to obtain some funding from Sacramento, which has allowed them to bring in an inventory of over 800 e-bikes and 40 cargo bikes that are going to be deployed to residents of the San Gabriel Valley, El Monte, Alhambra, uh, those types of cities, where people will be able to get access to these bikes uh, at a reduced cost for an extended period of time. So it is, in a way, shared micromobility. Um, but their objective is to hopefully change behavior by getting people onto electrically, electrically assisted vehicles and, uh, and the like. So we're going to be, we're really excited about this opportunity because it's kind of different from what we've done. And you know, we believe there's a huge upside uh, you know, with this. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for two or so more quick questions. I got, now we got one right here. I, one, one thing I find cycling is the, the danger because the the roads are kind of dangerous. I mean, I've crashed on bike lanes because there are potholes or ruts in there. That's one. And the other one, uh, these e-bikes are difficult to carry large, you know, medium-sized packages or children, and that might discourage people. Yeah, so um, 
the quick slide I showed on what our riders care about in terms of um, traffic safety, bike lanes far and away, biggest thing. Second biggest is smooth pavement, right? Which is also an issue for cyclists. Um, the kinds of um, new generation, next generation sensor fusion, you know, GPS, more granular understanding of where that vehicle is, how it's moving. It really allows some really interesting insights into um, helping cities target infrastructure improvement. You know, for example, if we see that only a few of our riders are swerving at a particular location, we could attribute that to like, you know, another motorist or, you know, something sort of random. But if a lot of our riders are swerving at a particular location, that probably points to some kind of infrastructure, you know, problem that needs to be solved. Um, similarly with sidewalk riding, as has been pointed out, sometimes and most of the time, probably it's a survival strategy, right? There isn't proper infrastructure there. And so if we're seeing a preponderance of riders behaving a certain way, that's really a, a great clue for the city. So um, looking forward to like helping cities like zero in on sort of where their infrastructure dollars can make the most difference for improving that experience. All right, let's do a last question. And then we'll, after this, there's a, there's a rooftop. I was quickly checking the schedule. There's a rooftop reception. And then after that, the California Bicycle Summit after party. And it was really hot. Yeah, we did. So there was a question over here somewhere. Oh, I just got one. Oh, so do we have in-person questions? No, okay, we'll do the last question will be the online question. And then we'll call a day and then we grab some beers or whatever it is after this and cool down a little bit. Uh, a, war a warning from municipalities or public agencies contracting for bike sharing facility studies based on Monterey County, uh, Mount County's experience, out of town contracts entirely left out uh, the largest city Salinas, which is well over one third of the county's population. Even though, even though the goal was to serve needs of residents as well as visitors. Instead, contracts is focused on Monterey Peninsula tourist areas. Be sure contracting agency of the, oh, of the municipality just continues. How do I get this? Uh, sure, That's a really long question. Yeah, be sure contracting, I can't get this window up. Oh, there. Okay. I think we okay. go towards the I, end. I it will be the question. Yeah. Be sure, be sure the contracting agency and municipality isn't wasting money by failing to emphasize to the contractors what the local needs are. So I guess it's, it's the difference between tourists and local needs. Let's start on that one. Yeah. So I think I, I think I get where the question is going. It's saying like, you know. Some, there are plenty of bike share systems, like the old system in Miami, for instance, um, was only along the coast, um, wasn't really set up for commuters or for residents. It was kind of like a vacation. It, it was very much like a tourist bike share system, not utilitarian. And um, we've seen other cities you know, adopt bike share systems like that. I think the reason they often do that is because they can find an operator who says, yeah, I'll set up just in the most profitable tourist, popular tourist area. Um, and it doesn't cost the city or municipality or county or whoever the contracting agent is any money. And so they're willing to go along with that. And I think I would agree with what the, the, the comment that was in there, which is essentially like, you know, um, I think advocates, cities should be looking out and saying, you know, hey, we, we don't just want a system that serves tourists or, or oftentimes we don't just want it to be downtown. We want this to be broad and we want it to serve the city and community more equitably. Um, and you know, from the and then the operator perspective is that's a you know great. Sometimes depends how big you want it. Sometimes that then might also require public investment. Um, and so that's I think the, the two sides of the coin. All right, thank you so much. Thank you all. Big round of applause for the speakers. And thank you for the people online. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you.